Good, good. It's going to be awesome. Last week we kicked off a series called Kingdom Identity. Who was here? I, uh, of all the passion, uh, of all the different topics, this is one of my favorite topics to talk about because identity is one of those things in Scripture that is from Genesis to Revelation. It's important. Uh, it's so important that you know who you are. We said this last week that you have to know your kingdom identity to actually fulfill your God-given destiny. There's no possible way you could be who God's made you to be if you don't know who you are. Uh, oftentimes in our culture, I think one of the number one questions people are asking is, what is my purpose? I think if we were to be honest, all of us would raise our hands and go, I want to know my purpose. But it's actually, it's not the right approach to pursue your purpose. It's actually better to uncover your identity yeah. because when you know who you are, you'll actually know what you were made to do. Yeah. And so this series, I, I really mean this. I think anytime you teach the Word of God, it has the opportunity to transform hearts. Uh, we know it does, but, but I do think this series could really, really change some lives and some hearts. And so I want to encourage you guys, show up hungry, lean in, and uh, just open your hearts to the Word of God as we dive in. Last week we were talking about how uh, we were really focusing on the foundation of identity, how your identity cannot be in what people say about you. Your identity cannot be in what you've done or what you do or what you have, and it definitely cannot be in how you feel. Your identity must be in Christ alone and what he says about you. Come on. Your identity has to be in Christ alone and what he says about you. The good news is uh, Jesus doesn't just tell you he loves you and tell you who, he, who you are. He demonstrated it at the cross. So your identity in Christ was actually sealed at the cross. Isn't it good to know in a world that's changing and moving and up and down and left and right, isn't it good to know that when it comes to your identity in Christ, it has been sealed and it will never change? You are in Christ and Christ is in you. And so regardless of how you're feeling or what storms you may be going through or any relational challenges you might be in, none of those things actually change who you are at the core. And so today we're going to go even deeper and I, I'm really excited to, to begin to talk about the implications of the cross, the implications of your new identity. What does it actually mean? And so today I want to talk about the new you. The new you, not the old you, the new you. Okay, and so we're going we're gonna to get kicked off uh, in 1 Corinthians 5.17. Let's read this. To, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Let's read this together. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. If the church believed this verse, everything would be different. If you believe this verse, everything in your life would be different. If I believe this verse to its fullest extent, to the reality of what it means, everything would be different. Do you understand that the decisions you make, the husband you are, the wife you are, the parents you are, the boss you are, the employer you are, everything about who you are is actually shaped through your identity. And Christians, uh, sometimes, you know, it's, it's real popular in today's culture to talk about being the best version of yourself. But here's the good news for believers. You don't become the best version of your old self. You need to discover the only version of your true self. You, 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 there, there's not like, you don't get like, a, you're not an iPhone, you don't get an upgrade every few months. It's this simple. The old is gone, the new has come. You're brand new. You are brand new. You've been made new. You're not just restored. You're not even just renewed. You are actually reborn. You're reborn. That means you're a whole new creation. You were made new. And here's the good news. You are just as new today as you were the day you got saved. Amen. See, we, we, we don't understand that because, you know, when, when it comes to like the things we buy, we buy new shoes and new cars and new houses, and, and over time they get old again. But that's not how it works with your identity in Christ. You are just as new today as the day you got saved, regardless of what you've done or how you feel. You're still new. It doesn't say you'll be new for a little while. It's like my kids, uh, they just went back to school, as you guys know, and we, we buy all the kids new shoes when they go back to school. And so I walk downstairs on orientation morning, and all three of my kids are walking like this, like penguins. 
And I thought they were joking. I, uh, what are you guys doing? Why are you guys walking like that? They said, we don't want to crease our shoes. You'd rather walk around school like a penguin than crease your shoes? I, I mean, I hate to tell you, but they're going to get creased and they're going to get dirty anyways. Like, just walk normal. That's how we treat our identity. We think uh, over time it's going to become dirt, dirty and damaged and we lose touch with who God actually made us to be. But that's not how it works. That's not the reality of your identity. You have been made new. The old is gone. The new has come. And when you get a revelation of who you actually are in Christ, it changes everything. The second you place your faith in Jesus and you receive his gift of salvation, you are reborn in Christ and you're a new creation that's received a new identity. Now to fully understand your identity in Christ, you have to understand how God created you as a person. We talked last week about how God made each one of us in his image. We know that. We've been made in the image of God. It's what separates you from all other creation. As beautiful as animals are and trees and sunsets and oceans and, and mountains and all the beautiful things, they can reflect God's glory, but only you can reflect God's image. There's nothing else on the planet that can reflect the image of God like you. You were made in the image of God. But you got to understand, and this is where sometimes we get mixed up, that when God created us, he didn't just create a body, he created us body, soul, and spirit. Somebody's life is about to change today, I promise you. You are not just a body. You, you, when God made us, he made us body, soul, and spirit. He created us all three. I want to read 1 Thessalonians 5.23. This is where Paul gives us this revelation. He says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. How many of you know we need to be sanctified completely? Not, I mean, we're all partially sanctified, but, but God wants to make us all completely new. You've been, uh, he, he himself will sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This revelation will change your life. Some of you today are going to understand why God's word says you're new, but you still feel depressed and you still struggle with temptation and you still have hard things happening in your life because you're not just uh, you're not just body, your body, soul, and spirit. And today I'm going to help us understand what actually happened at the moment of salvation and then what is this process of becoming new in Christ actually look like. I believe it's going to help us all today. And so I love how it says that the God of peace himself wants to sanctify you completely and make you whole. There's sometimes where we can, did you know it's possible to be spiritually strong and healthy, but emotionally weak? Did you know it's possible to be emotionally healthy and physically weak? Did you know it's possible to be physically healthy and be spiritually bankrupt and weak? We, while these are three separate components of who we are, we have to understand they're all woven together, and together it is who you are as a person. One affects the other. If you, get, if you get an extreme depression or extreme anxiety or extreme fear, which is in your soul realm, it will affect your body. If, if, if your body is sick or something like that, that will affect your soul, your emotions. And so all of these things are together. And today I'm asking God to give us a greater revelation of what this means. I want to put a quick graphic on uh, the screen behind me to help us understand exactly what's happening. This is how God made you. You are all of the above. You are spirit. That's actually where your identity is found. Your identity, you should identify with who God says you are in the spirit, not in the soul or the body. Your identity is not in your body and it's not in your personality. We talked about this last week. Your soul is where your mind, your will, and your emotions are. Come on, your mind is where your thoughts live, your emotions are where your feelings live, and your will is where your choices live. That is what makes up your personality. Last week I made a statement and I said, we have to understand that there's a difference between our personality and our identity. Because oftentimes our personality can be shaped through pain, but our identity was shaped from purpose. 
So many of us are getting our identity from our body or our soul, our personality, but that's not your identity. Now, don't get me wrong. When, we, when, when our personality comes under submission and under the influence of the Spirit of God, then we do have a God-given personality. That is something God gives you. You are unique. You are the way you are because God made you that way. But how many of you know that as we go throughout life, there are thoughts and choices and feelings that get broken and we experience pain and some of those things can actually shape the personality that we're living in right now amen and so the good news for us is that you are a spirit that has a soul that's living in a body think about it for a second you primarily are not your body. You're, how many of you know we're getting new bodies one day? Praise God. Come on, praise break. Somebody, somebody do a victory lab or something. We're getting new bodies one day. You are not your body. You are not even your soul or your personality because your personality isn't completely pure because you've experienced pain and brokenness in your life. You are a spirit that has a soul that is living in a body. Come on, this is good news because that means our identity can be sure, it can be pure, it can be grounded, and it can be founded on the Word of God, and there's nothing anybody could ever do or say, including yourself, to change who you are in Christ. We've got to start getting our identity from the reality that we are a spirit. We're not just a spirit. God says we're now His temple. Come on! You're a temple of the Holy Spirit. We talk about uh, our, our vision here at Revive is to build a house for God's presence. Well, did you know you are a house for God's presence? You are a house for God's presence. You're a temple of the Holy Spirit, and you are now the place of all the places God could choose to, to let his presence rest. He chose you. Now, this is interesting because... If you think about the reality that we're temples of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says this, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you and whom you have from God? You are not your own. So God's making this connection between who we are in our bodies and being his temple. I want to put another graphic up to help us understand that We're spirit, soul, and body, and it actually is a replication of the tabernacle where there's an outer court, an inner court, and a holy of holies. And so I, I, don't, I don't have time to do a teaching on the tabernacle, but, but it was the outer court that they had to sacrifice the flesh. It was the inner court where their minds were renewed, and it was the holy of holies where the presence of God dwelled. It's the same for you. Your body is is where our flesh has to be crucified. Our soul, our mind, our will, and our emotions, where our feelings, our thoughts, and our choices live, that has to be renewed to come into alignment with the mind of Christ. And in the holy of holies, in your spirit, God's spirit is in your spirit, and that is where the tabernacle lives. That's where the presence of God dwells, and that is where your kingdom identity lives. So today, I'm hoping some of you are willing to break up with your old self that you've been identifying as your new self, because you are not that. You are a spirit where the presence of God dwells. I want to go a little deeper as we're talking about the spirit here. I want to just keep restating this. The second you gave your life to Jesus, the second you received salvation, you were given a brand new spirit, and you were given the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like last week we talked about how God formed man out of the dust of the earth, but he wasn't alive yet, was he? At that point, he was just a body. You're not your body. But then God takes Adam, and he brings him close, and he breathes the breath of God, which is the spirit of God, into him. And then the Bible says, and then man became a living being. He, he's, he's, help, he's trying to help us understand you are not your body and your body is not what makes you alive. You are a spirit and until my spirit was in you, you were not fully alive. Yeah. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. You, you're, and so a, another way to think about this, because again, there's this question that I think we've all had. Well, if I'm new, how come everything's not different? How come I still am tempted by things and have dark thoughts and all these different things? Well, think about it this way. 
At the moment of salvation, your spirit is saved completely, pure, perfect, holy, righteous, all the things that God says you are. But your soul is being saved. Come on. And your body will be saved. Your body will be saved. It's the reverse of what happened at the fall. Remember, God tells Adam and Eve, in the day you eat of the fruit, you will surely die. Well, they eat the fruit, and who else has asked the question, why didn't they die? <laughs> well, they did die. Why? Because they are a spirit, and they experienced a spiritual death, and eventually their body caught up to that reality. The opposite is true for us. At the moment of salvation, we are made spiritually alive, and eventually we will be given a new body that's more in alignment with the spirit that God gave us. Romans 8, verse 10 says, and Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit is what gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Come on. We don't believe it though. We really don't believe this because when we do, it's going to change everything. When we, when we get our identity from the reality that we have been made new in the Spirit, it changes everything. Our spirit has been made new because the Holy Spirit is inside of us. Romans 8.14 says, Those that are led by the Spirit of God will be called the children of God. So let me, let me explain it uh, maybe a different way. You're, at the fall, uh, what happened was our body and our soul, which is where our mind, uh, where our mind will, and uh, emotions, where all of that lives, they were under submission to our spirit, to the Holy Spirit. In other words, the spirit was the leader, and our souls and our bodies followed our spirit. After the fall, there was separation from the presence of God. We spiritually died, and then our soul, our mind, will, and emotions, and our body began being led by the flesh. But Jesus came to the earth, lived a perfect life, died on a cross, and those that are willing to have faith with him are completely restored to their identity. And because of that reality, now what it's saying in Romans is that we can bring our soul and our body back under the authority and influence of the Holy Spirit. And that is what children of God do, according to Romans. Those that are led by the Spirit of God are called the children of God. Another way to say it is your soul, where your mind, will, and emotions are, is actually neutral. It can go in either direction. It will either turn and follow the flesh, or you can make a choice to turn it and follow the spirit. Most of our problems are because our soul is following the flesh and not following the spirit. Good news for you, though, even when that happens, that's still not your identity, this is still your identity. All you have to do is turn. That's actually what repentance is about. Repentance isn't about go, uh, you know, go, go weep and, and cover yourself in ashes and mourn and, and be covered in shame. It's about, hey, son, hey, daughter, you're doing something that doesn't align with your kingdom identity. Would you be willing to stop and change your mind and turn back to the Spirit and begin to follow the Spirit again? That's what God cares about in repentance. He doesn't want you to flounder in shame. He wants you to walk in the royal identity that he died to give you. Well, how do we know if we're following the flesh or following the spirit? Can I tell you something? Your spirit doesn't have to be saved. It's already been saved. There's nothing you can do to make your spirit more holy and more, more pure than it is right now because that's where the Holy Spirit lives. And he would not be present in an unholy environment. But what, what, what does happen is you don't have to save your spirit, but you do have to feed your spirit. You say, am I being led by the flesh or by the spirit? Whatever one you're feeding is leading. Whatever one you're feeding the most is leading the most. You don't, you don't, have, to, you don't have to feed your spirit to, to, to make it more pure and poor. You have to feed your spirit so that your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions, your feelings, your choices, that when you feed the spirit, you are telling your soul, you, feelings, emotions, and choices are going to come under the influence of the Holy Spirit. 
This is what sanctification is. This is the process that God is calling his disciples to go on. Good news, this is never about perfection because we're not ever going to be perfect on this side of heaven, but this is about progress. This is about being conformed more into the image of Jesus every day. This is about every day trying to, trying to be more and more victorious over the flesh and come more into alignment with the Spirit of God over your life. This is what King's kids look like. They, they follow the Spirit. They have, uh, they have been given power to overcome the flesh. It's not your power. It's not uh, just have more willpower. It's God says, you've not been given a spirit of fear. He's talking to his kids, his disciples. You've not been given a spirit of fear, but you've been given a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. When you walk in power, love, and a sound mind, you can tell your soul, soul, you better come into alignment with the Spirit of God. You better get under the influence and under the authority of the Spirit of God because my feelings were never meant to lead my life. The Spirit was. Feelings lead people that are led by the flesh. The Spirit, those that are children of God, are led by the Spirit of God. Whatever your feeding is leading... Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 18. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. I want to be clear, your flesh, in the, in, in, when the Scripture is talking about your flesh, it's not talking about your body. Your, you, God made you in His image, body, soul, and spirit. Jesus had a body, soul, and spirit. Your body is not evil. Your body's beautiful. Your body's amazing. Your body was made in the image of God. When we're talking about the flesh, we're not talking about your body. We're talking about the old sin nature that Jesus delivered you from that wants to keep creeping back into your life through your soul. And the way it does is what you listen to, what you look at, the choices you make, the thoughts you think, this is the gateway into your life. Pay attention to what you're feeding, and I just want to encourage you, feed your spirit. That's why you're here right now. We're feeding our spirits. Come on, our spirits are being fed. And I, I just want to tell you something. When your mind doesn't understand something, when you're reading the Bible and your mind doesn't understand it, your spirit does. The revelation sometimes surpasses our own understanding, but our spirit has no problem understanding it. Don't, don't say, I just don't read the Bible, I don't get it. That's okay, you're not feeding your flesh, you're feeding your spirit. You're not feeding your soul, where, which is where your mind, your intellect lives. You're not feeding that, you're feeding your spirit. Read it anyways. And keep reading it, and keep reading it, and watch as your whole identity begins to be transformed. I want to talk for a second about your soul. Again, just to have a better understanding of these components of your mind, your will, and your emotions. Again, this is neutral. It can follow the flesh or it can follow the spirit. And so um, this is why, again, when we say we're a new creation, our soul, our mind, will, and emotions still needs to be sanctified by the Word of God. It still needs to be sanctified by the Spirit of God. It, uh, if that's a big word, but just, just think transformed. Our, uh, any, anybody in the room still struggling with bad thoughts? Anybody in the room still struggling with depression? Anybody in the room still struggling with fear? Come on, every hand should be up by now. Anybody in the room still struggling with anxiety? That, guess what? You don't, again, you can struggle with any of those things, and that's still not your identity. That's still not your identity. That just is letting you know, hey, there is some part of your soul that is not completely yet under the influence of the Holy Spirit. That should be hopeful. That should be encouraging. That should, that should give you life because the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Any part of your soul that is not experiencing righteousness, peace, and joy means, guess what? Submit that under the authority and influence of the Holy Spirit. Come on. Romans 12, 2, a passage that many of us are familiar with, says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, 
his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Notice this is dealing with the soul. It's not talking about renew your spirit. It's not talking about any of that. The verse before it actually says to, to give your bodies as a living sacrifice. It's, call, it's telling you give your body as a sacrifice and renew your mind. Why? Because you don't need a new spirit. You have a new spirit. That's where your identity is. But, but the way that we put our body under the, under the influence of the Spirit and the way that we renew our mind is by taking our will and submitting it to God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. This is how you become more like Jesus. This is how you are transformed. This is, again, what's known as sanctification. It's, 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 it's when our soul and our body are coming more into alignment with the Spirit. And so, it's not really theologically accurate to say we need more of the Holy Spirit because you have all of the Holy Spirit He could possibly give you. He lives in you. I mean, he, there's an unlimited source of the Holy Spirit inside of you. You don't need more of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit needs more of you. The Holy Spirit needs more of your thoughts. He needs more of your choices. He needs more of your feelings. He, he, he wants, to, he, he wants that, that, that center circle that's where the Spirit is. He wants to invade and influence every part of our whole being so that we, children of God, are led by the Spirit of God. This is what God is wanting. We, we don't need more of Him. He needs more of us. The more, of, the more you submit your feelings to the Holy Spirit, guess what? The more you're going to feel the Holy Spirit. And you're going to think, wow, he just, he gave me more of himself. No, he didn't give you more of himself. You submitted that part of yourself to him and he let him influence that part of you. God's not withholding anything from you. God's not withholding his spirit from you. He addresses this when he says, which of you, if you were to ask your father for a fish, would he give him a snake? If he were to ask for bread, would he give him a stone? If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? He's not wanting to withhold anything. We're actually withholding those parts of our life that we're not willing to surrender to Him. We're, we're withholding those parts of our life that we want to hang on to. My counsel to you today is surrender. Let Him have it. And the only way you'll be willing to do that is if you know how good He is. You, you go... You go, man, I, I don't want to let go of this. I don't, what if he doesn't give this back? What if I don't fulfill the desires of my heart? You're back to personality. you got to understand, God knows your identity more than anybody. He created you for a specific purpose. And if you surrender your whole life to his leadership, he will lead you to a place of fulfillment that you never dreamed possible. you got to trust he's good and give him everything. We got to begin to take our soul and bring it under alignment of the Spirit. I love this. David says this in Psalm 43 5. He's talking to himself. We've all done it in the shower. We've all done it. He says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted or at turmoil within me? Hope in God. I shall praise him, my salvation and my God. Come on, we got to do this more often. We got to do this more often. We got we to gotta talk to our soul, our feelings, and say, why are you cast down? Why are you depressed? Why are you anxious? Hope in God. Come under the influence of God. Begin to praise God. Begin to, begin to remind yourself that your salvation is in God alone, not anything you can do in your own strength. Guess what happens when you begin to take your, your bad, hard feelings and submit them to the Holy Spirit? Then you begin to feel what the Holy Spirit feels. Some of you didn't feel like coming to church today, but halfway in the worship set, you felt a lot better, didn't you? Why? Because you took your flesh and you brought it under the authority of the Spirit. Some of you don't feel like spending time with Jesus in the morning, but then afterwards you feel better, don't you? Because he's the source of life and you need your daily bread. It, it, you gotta, we got to stop being led by our feelings, church. we got to start being led by the Spirit. David says, why are you cast down? Hope in God. Worship him. Praise him. Jesus perhaps gives us one of the greatest demonstrations of, of taking his will and submitting it to the will of the Father in Luke twenty two forty two, He says, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. We don't serve a God that can't relate to what we're going through. We don't serve a God that, that, 
can identify with the suffering we're going through. We don't serve a God that goes, but you don't understand how hard it is to surrender this thing to God. No, we serve a God who in his moment of crushing and when the moment came, he knew he would be uh, whipped and beaten and hung on a cross and that wasn't even the worst part for him. The worst part was taking on the sin of all humanity. He knew that body, soul, and spirit, he was about to give up everything and he, he was honest. He said, if you're willing, Father, if you're willing, would you take this cup from me? Jesus had this moment of, I don't want to have to go through this But then he did the ultimate thing. He said, but I'm not led by my feelings, Father. I'm not led by my soul, Father. I only do what I see my Father doing. So not my will, but yours be done. And Jesus went through suffering. We know he gave his life for us. And on this side of the cross, do you think Jesus is happy that he surrendered his will to the will of the Father. Come on, you never regret following the Spirit. You will never regret following the Spirit. Galatians 2.20 says this, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives within me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Come on. Your old self was crucified with Christ. Stop identifying with that person. It's on the cross. It's dead. It's buried. It's gone. You you, no longer need to identify with that person. Now you identify with the reality that Christ lives within me. Christ, the hope of glory, is in me, and he's my identity. And even when I fall short, and even when I don't feel it, and even when I mess up, that's not who I am. That's, that, that, my, my soul just turned back to the flesh for a moment and I made a bad choice, but I'm going to repent. I'm going to turn and begin to be a son or daughter of God and follow the Spirit of God again. We serve a king who identified us in every way. And he paid every price needed for you to be completely made new, body, soul, and spirit. Did you know that when Jesus was whipped, when that whip was tearing his flesh, he was taking the penalty in his body so that one day you could have a new body? Did you know that when that crown of thorns was shoved into Jesus' head, that he was letting you know I'm going to take the pain in my mind so that you can be completely free. You don't have to be led by anxiety. You don't have to be led by fear. I'm going to let them drive these thorns into my mind, and I'm going to pay the price so that you can follow the Spirit and be completely free. And then when it was all said and done, Jesus says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He gave up his spirit so that your spirit could be made brand new. Jesus has done it all. You are a new creation. You have been made new. You don't have to keep identifying with the old self. He paid it all. He took stripes on his back. He had thorns on his head. And he willingly chose to give up his spirit so that you, your spirit would be saved, your soul was being saved, and one day you will be given a resurrected body. If that doesn't bring you joy, I don't know what will. You say, Pastor, I don't, I don't like this conversation about suffering and surrender. The, I'd rather talk about being blessed. Can I tell you something? Church, the greatest blessing in your life is not the size of your bank account. It is not the size of your house. It is not the car you drive. It's not even the relationships you have. The greatest blessing you have ever received is the fact that Jesus willingly surrendered his body, his soul, and his spirit so that he could take what you deserved and then he would give us the opportunity to surrender our body, our soul, and our spirit and we get what he deserved which is a kingdom inheritance. Everything Jesus had he made available to you. You're, You're not an orphan. You're not 
you're not just you're not just trash. You are now a king's kid. He he said, I'm gonna take everything and then I'm gonna give you access to this new identity that makes you a son or a daughter of the king. That to me sounds like a blessing. That it is it is our honor to present our bodies as living sacrifices. We Unlike Jesus, we don't have to pay the price. We, we, we surrender our body and he gives us a new one. Unlike Jesus, we don't have to take the thorns to our head. We surrender our minds, our thoughts, our feelings, our choices to Jesus and he gives us the mind of Christ. Unlike Jesus, we don't have to feel abandoned by the Father and Jesus goes, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We get to experience the opposite. If we will surrender our spirit, the Father doesn't forsake us. He comes to us and He fills us with His very presence, which is your primary identity. Are you grateful for the cross? Are you grateful for what Jesus did? I know that I am. Ephesians 4.24 says, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. But be made new in the attitude of your minds and put on the new self created like God to be true righteousness and holiness. That is who you are. That is who God says you are. You say, I don't feel righteous. If you're saved, you are. You say, I don't feel holy. Well, that's because you're looking at your soul. You're not looking at your spirit. Your, Your spirit is the holy of holies. It's where the presence of God chooses to dwell. Get your eyes off your soul. Get your eyes off your feelings. Get your eyes off your failures. Get your eyes off your mistakes. Get your eyes off your past. And simply put your eyes on Jesus because it is in Him alone that you find your identity. Your identity is not over here and it's not over there. It's in Christ alone. And you have to look at Him and receive everything He said about you. God's Word is the only thing that has the authority to identify you and the ability to transform you. That's it. That's why in Hebrews 4.12, it says, For the word of God is alive and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow. Like God in true righteousness, or joints and marrow, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The writer of Hebrews is letting you know the Word of God is so alive, it's so powerful that it gives your soul what your soul needs, your spirit what your spirit needs, and your body what your body needs. There is nothing that the Word of God cannot define and fill and make come fully alive in Christ. Come on. Why don't we stand? I want to pray as we close. John 2 2 says this beloved I pray that you may prosper in being come on you guys know the word that's what I'm talking about I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers I want to close by praying quickly for all three if there's people in here and your your body is not well I want to pray that your body is healed because Jesus paid a price for that If there's people in here and your soul is not well, and I can tell already that there's lots of people in this room, I can just feel the Lord wanting to touch minds today. If there's people in this room and your soul is not well, if, if you're feeling depression or anxiety, crippling spirit of fear or anything, I I just want to pray that today you're delivered from that because that's not your inheritance. And if there's people in this room and you've not been born again in Christ, I just want to give you the opportunity to say yes to Jesus. And when you do, understand that you are going to be made brand new. Why don't we bow our heads? I want to start with those that want to give their lives to Jesus because then I'm going to pray for your soul and your body as well. So you're going to get all three. (laughs) If there's anybody in this room and you don't know for sure, that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. You don't, I'm not just saying, did you pray a prayer or did you do this or do that? If you don't know that you know God, 
I want to give you the opportunity to do that today, and you'll never have to wonder for the rest of your life. What you're doing right now is what I talked about. You are taking your will, your choice, and you're making a choice to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life. And so while everybody's heads are bowed and eyes are closed, in a second, I'm just going to count to three, and I just want you to raise your hand if you want to give your life to Jesus today, and I'm going to lead you in a prayer to do that. So on the count of three, if you want to be made new today, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. Just raise it high. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. Praise God. Raise it high. Thank you, God. Raise it high. Thank you, Jesus. At this time, you can put your hands down, and I just want you to pray with me. In the church, if you want to pray this as well, let's just be one big family today. Say, Jesus, forgive me for my sin. Today, I want to surrender my heart to you. Jesus, I believe that you came to this earth. You died on a cross. You were buried in the ground. And you rose from the dead. And because of that, I'm asking you today to be my Lord and Savior. Holy Spirit, come fill me now with your presence and my identity. I know today that I'm being made brand new in Christ. Amen. All right, we'll celebrate that in one second. I want to pray for souls. I I, I want to ask everybody to pray this with me. Just, I, I feel strongly that there's people in this room that are experiencing depression and anxiety and fear. And I'm just here today to tell you that is not your identity, that you, you do not have to accept that. We, we all probably go through it at some times. It doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't make you a sinner. It just means that we need the help of God to come deliver us from that thing. And so church together, let's just, just join me in praying. Father, right now, I pray over every mind in this room. God, I pray, Lord, that, that you would deliver every mind that's struggling with depression right now in the name of Jesus. We break the name of depression. God, I pray right now for a, for a spirit of anxiety to leave right now in the name of Jesus. God, I pray that the peace of God, which passes all understanding, would fall on minds right now in the name of Jesus. God, right now, we pray against the spirit of fear. Lord, those that have a fear of death or a fear, fear of failure or a fear of sickness, God, right now, Holy Spirit, I say, come deliver them now in the name of Jesus. And God, I pray that you would give them the mind of Christ. I feel like there's some people in this room that you've had trouble sleeping at night. In fact, last night was the first night in years that I didn't sleep all night. And I feel like God wants to deliver some people from not sleeping. So Father, right now, Lord, your word says you give sleep to those you love. I'm asking you right now that the deepest, most restful sleep would come on those people that have been had trouble sleeping right now in the name of Jesus. And God, right now, for anybody that needs healing in their body, Lord, we pray over backs, we pray over knees, we pray over sickness, we pray over disease. We just say, Jesus, you accomplished it on the cross. You said you were bruised for our transgressions and you were crushed for our iniquities and by your stripes we have been healed. So we just speak healing right now over everybody in the name of Jesus. Come on, let's celebrate what God did today. Come on. For those of you that gave your lives to Jesus, I want to invite you uh, when we finish up, you can come forward. We want to give you a Bible and a letter with some next steps from me, just encouraging you in your journey. Uh, for anybody that, that needs uh, hands laid on you in prayer for your soul, for your mind, for depression, for anxiety, for healing, for anything, we have the most amazing team up here, and their greatest joy is to pray for you. So I want to invite you, if that's you, to come forward. For everybody else, don't forget you can sign up for small groups on the way out. Next week, we're going to continue our series. It's going to be awesome. God bless you guys. Have an amazing week.